Dancing in the night with a tail as big as a cow.
joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Sing choirs of angels, sing in exaltation. O sing, all ye citizens of heaven above. Glory to God, glory in the highest. O come, let us adore Him. O come, let us adore Him. O come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Lord, we greet Thee, born this happy morning, O Jesus, to Thee be a glory given. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing, O come, let us adore Him, O come, let us adore him oh come let us adore him Christ the Lord we are standing in between hope and despair believing in your grace and the faith to declare you are with us, Alleluia, Alleluia, you are good. In the ashes and the dust, the sorrow and pain, lies the promise of your word and the power of your name. You are with us, Alleluia, Alleluia, you are good. And when faith gives way to fear, I will trust your heart, I will trust your heart when I can. I will trust your heart, I will trust your heart. There's a message being written with the morning sun, and a new song for the broken, death is lost, love is won. You are with us, hallelujah. Hallelujah, you are good. You are with us. Hallelujah, hallelujah, you are good. Hallelujah, you are good.
Good morning and Merry Christmas, Moon Valley. Today we are wrapping up our sermon series titled The Christmas I Never Knew, and it's based on a study of Revelation chapter 12, which presents a very unusual Christmas story. In our previous studies, we've learned that in the book of Revelation, God reveals to the Apostle John symbolic visions of the history and the future. In particular, uh, Revelation 12 contains a Christmas story, but the characters um, are far different than the ones in our traditional nativity scenes that include shepherds and wise men and Joseph and Mary. In Revelation 12, we get a glimpse of an unseen Christmas in the spiritual realm, where we do see the Christ, uh, Christ child, but we also see a, a woman who symbolizes the people of Israel from whom the child uh, was to come, and we see a dragon who symbolizes Satan, who seeks to devour both the child and the woman. In this Christmas story, uh, Jesus was born in the middle of a spiritual war. And this is not Christmas card material, but as it turns out, I think it is perhaps even more hopeful. You see, Revelation 12 casts the first advent, Christmas, in the context of God's unfolding plan leading up to the hope of a second advent, Christ's second coming. And specifically from our text for today in verses 13 through 17, we're going to see that God's hand is in control and his word is incontestable, which is the bedrock of our hope. And from this, I draw a very personal application for you and me. It's the big idea of my sermon right up front. If God's hand is in control and his word is incontestable, then our hope is secure. Now, this is such good, uh, refreshing uh, news in our current season, which outwardly, um, you know, things seem so out of control and the words of authorities seem so unreliable and contestable. And I suspect many of you agree with this big idea. But the thing is, once in a while, we could use some evidence of God's hand to see that it is indeed in control. We could use some evidence once in a while that, that God's word is indeed incontestable. Otherwise, as tough times drone on, it's easy to begin to think that God's faithfulness is just wishful thinking on our part, and we can begin to lose hope. And so let's dig in. As an overview, uh, let's read through our text, and then we'll go back and look at it more carefully. Verse 13 begins, and when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. Well, that's our text. You know, some of you are probably wondering, Bob, 
How in the world are you going to tease a hopeful Christmas sermon out of that? Well, we're going to have to do a little work, but it's it's there. And I think you're going to be encouraged if you're able to hang with me through this. The first verse of our text, verse 13, essentially summarizes the entire chapter. The Christmas story uh, begins with the woman symbolizing the people of Israel giving birth to the male child who is Jesus Christ. That's history. But at some point in the future, after the birth of Jesus, the, the dragon, who is Satan, also called uh, the serpent in our text, he is going to be thrown down to the earth. The text describes it as if it had already occurred, but it has not. Remember, this is John recounting for us the visions uh, of the future that God gave him. Last week, we learned that uh, all this is likely uh, going to happen in the middle of a seven-year tribulation period. Then after the dragon is thrown down, he will pursue the woman with cruelty in an attempt to destroy her. And the rest of our text describes the dragon pursuing the woman in vivid, uh, symbolic uh, detail. And in the middle of the description, there's this odd-sounding time stamp. In verse 14, it says the woman is going to be nourished for a time and times, and half a time. It may sound like gibberish to us, but to those well-versed in the Hebrew scriptures, this would have rung a bell. The expression is used only two other places in uh, all of scripture. It's used in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, and again in Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, um, Two verses which roughly bookend a famous section of the book of Daniel dealing with prophetic visions of the future. Now, in all three places, uh, two in Daniel, one here in Revelation, the expression refers to the three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. A time equals one year, times equals two years, half a time equals six months. So put them all together, a time and times and half a time equals three and a half years. And you may be thinking, that sounds a little arbitrary, Bob. I don't know about that. Well, the duration of time is confirmed in Revelation 11.2. And again in 13.5, where the same period is referred to as lasting 42 months. That's three and a half years. And in Revelation 12.6, it is described as lasting 1260 days, which again is three and a half years by ancient Jewish reckoning, which counts years as comprised of 360 days. The point I'm trying to make is that the expression, a time, and times, and half a time in our text, not only designates the Great Tribulation period, but it also points us back to Daniel, which puts all this in uh, some historical perspective. In particular, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27 provides the historical perspective we need to, uh, to see that God's hand is in control and his word is incontestable. This text in Daniel was written over 500 years before Christ, and in only four verses, an incredible amount of prophetic information is provided about the future, and much of it has already occurred. Now, it's cryptic, it's complicated, it's connected to Revelation 12, but it's beautiful when you put it all together. Now, first, I'm simply going to unpack and arrange 
all the biblical data from Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27, in the form of the mother of all diagrams. <laughs> then we'll go back and do some interpretation. The diagram uh, will be on the screen, and it's also in the sermon notes available online as well. We're going to walk through the text in the order in which it is presented. My goal in this first pass is to simply lay out um, the biblical information as it's given. And then afterward, we'll consider an interpretation that best fits all the data. This is going to be like uh, drinking water from a fire hose. Don't worry if you're not able to take it all in. Just catch what you can. And you don't need to get every little thing to experience the full impact at the end. Just keep your head to the hose and you will be quenched. In the first part of verse 24, the angel Gabriel says to Daniel, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city. Now, you'll notice now that I'm using the New American Standard Bible instead of the English Standard Version because I think it provides a clear translation of this text in Daniel and it reduces the amount of explaining I need to do. From verse 24, we glean that the vision is about a 70-week period. And I'm going to use an arrow to represent the 70 weeks in the diagram. We also learn from this verse that the 70 weeks are not decreed for everyone, but specifically for the, the people and the holy city of Daniel. Remember, we're not trying to interpret anything yet. We're just gathering all the information. In the second part of verse 24, we are given six purposes for the 70 weeks. Uh, so we would expect to see these purposes fulfilled at the end of the 70-week period. These purposes are to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. In verse 25, the first 69 weeks of the 70-week period are defined. It says, uh, So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And so the first 69 weeks are divided into two subsegments, seven weeks plus 62 weeks. And you'll notice that the line is not to scale. Don't worry about it. The beginning of the 69 weeks will be marked by a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. The end of the period will conclude, it says, with Messiah, the Prince. And it appears that at the end of the first seven weeks, it'll be marked by uh, Jerusalem being rebuilt because the end of verse 25 says of Jerusalem, it will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Verse 26 continues describing uh, something that will happen after the 62 weeks are completed. It says, then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. It's important to note that the Messiah will be cut off after the 62 weeks, not before. Then after the 62 weeks, and apparently after the Messiah is cut off, Daniel is told in the last part of verse 26 that the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. This speaks of the destruction of 
a city at the hands of the people of the prince who is to come. Now, this is not the same prince as the Messiah back in verse 25. This prince is distinguished as the one who is to come after. For now, we'll just call him the bad prince. Then verse 27 begins to discuss the final week um, or the 70th week, indicating that it will begin with some kind of covenant. It says, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. Now, the nearest antecedent to the personal pronoun he is the bad prince who is to come. It is he who will uh, make the covenant. And whatever this covenant is, it appears that it will be struck sometime after the two important events already mentioned when the Messiah is cut off and when the city and sanctuary are destroyed. And notice that these two events happen after the end of the 69 weeks, but before the start of the 70th week. So we have a curious gap between the 69th week and the 70th week. And then verse 27 says this about the 70th week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And so the final week is divided into two half weeks. And in the middle, the bad prince to come puts a stop to some forms of worship, namely sacrifice and offering. Then... In verse 27, Daniel is also told that in the middle of the 70th week, uh, someone described as the one who makes desolate will start abominations. It says, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. But the vision uh, concludes in verse 27 by saying that at the end of the 70th week, The one who makes desolate will himself be completely destroyed. It says, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Well, we have uh, gathered pretty much all the information uh, from the vision in our text, and we've put it in this diagram. Now, what does it all mean? mean? Uh, Let me give you um, an interpretation that I I think best fits the biblical data. But first, we need to define what a week is. Now, in English, we almost always use the term uh, week to describe seven days. But in Hebrew, the, the language in which Daniel 9 was originally written, the term for week simply means a period of seven Uh, And it was not uncommon in Daniel's day to use it to describe uh, uh, seven years. And that is precisely how it is used in Daniel 9. And with that, we can fill in all the time periods in years in our diagram. For example, the 70-week period spans 490 years. And now we can begin an interpretive run through the 70 weeks chronologically starting at the beginning. The decree to rebuild Jerusalem is probably the decree of the Medo-Persian Persian king Artaxerxes that came in 444 BC. It's recorded in Nehemiah chapter 2 verses 1 through 8. Prophecy fulfilled. Lo and behold, After seven weeks, that's 49 years, we know from history that the rebuilding of Jerusalem was indeed completed around 395 BC, another prophecy fulfilled. And then after 69 weeks, or 483 years, the Messiah comes. Now, to to what date does this refer? Well, The calculation gets a little tricky because Jewish prophetic years or lunar years are only 360 days long. 
and you have to figure in leap years and consider that there's only one year between 1 BC and AD 1. There is no 0 AD. And when you consider all that, the coming of the Messiah corresponds exactly with Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem in AD 33. It's the day when Christ officially presented himself to Israel as Messiah, prophecy fulfilled. And we know that within days of the Messiah's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he was cut off. That is, he was crucified, prophecy fulfilled. And then we know from history that the city and sanctuary um, destroyed Those were Jerusalem and the temple, respectively, at the hands of the Romans in A.D. 70, prophecy fulfilled. The crucifixion and the destruction of Jerusalem occurred in the gap between the 69th and 70th week. Well, what is that gap? Well, the gap is a kind of parenthetical um, uh, time that includes the church age, We are now in that gap, and we don't know how long it's going to last. Which raises the question, why didn't Gabriel explain the gap or this church age? Well, in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, the Apostle Paul explains in retrospect that the church was a mystery, not revealed until it came. Moreover, I suspect Gabriel didn't explain it because the nation of Israel and the church are distinct. They're not not the same. And remember, Gabriel tells Daniel that this vision is for your people and your holy city. That is, it's for the nation of Israel. The church age will end And the 70th week will begin when some kind of covenant, probably a peace agreement, is made between the coming bad prince and the Jews. And the bad prince is likely the Antichrist. The 70th week, commonly known as the tribulation, will last seven years. And this prophecy has not yet been fulfilled, and we don't know when it's going to happen. It could happen at any time. In the middle of the tribulation, after three and a half years, the Antichrist will put a stop to Jewish worship of God, and he will initiate abominations against the people of God, lasting another three and a half years. And this final three and a half years is known as the Great Tribulation, it's the period described in our text in Revelation 12, where Satan oppresses the people of Israel. It's the time and times and half a time. After the 70th week is up, at the end of the Great Tribulation, Christ will return to establish his kingdom. He will will fulfill his uh, purposes and destroy the Antichrist. Well, we have interpreted the the 70 weeks of Daniel chapter 9, and we've uh, completed our diagram accordingly. And some of you may be thinking, Bob, I think you lost me somewhere between Artaxerxes and the Antichrist. That's okay. You don't need to understand every bit of this to see that God's hand is indeed in control. History is unfolding according to his incontestable word, and his plan is for our good. Our hope is secure, even when times seem bad. I want you to note that at any point during the 70 weeks, Circumstances can seem really good, like the rebuilding of Jerusalem or Christ's triumphal entry, or things can seem really bad, like the crucifixion of Jesus or the destruction of Jerusalem. But none of this catches God by surprise. 
It's all part of the unfolding plan leading to another Christmas, another Advent better than the first, the second coming of Christ. And our text in Revelation 12, verses 13 through 17, describes a bad time during the Great Tribulation. But in God's plan, it's just the darkness before the dawn of Christ's second coming. And I suspect some of you may be wondering, uh, Bob, will we have to go through the tribulation? There are a lot of different opinions about this, and for reasons I don't have time today to fully explain, I, I think we who are believers today will not have to experience the tribulation. Concurrent with the beginning of the tribulation, I believe God will come to take all believers in the church from the earth to be with him forever. It's an event called the rapture. And I believe this happens before the tribulation, and hence it's called a pre-tribulational rapture view. One piece of evidence for this is um, in Revelation 3.10, where the Lord says to the church, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. I believe the Lord will keep us from the hour of the tribulation by rapturing us from the earth before the tribulation begins. But all this gets back to the big idea. If God's hand is in control and his word is incontestable, then our hope is secure. The COVID Christmas of 2020 is not depicted anywhere in our diagram, but it was decreed uh, in God's design before the beginning of time. Right now, We don't see it as a bright spot. We are grieving the loss of normalcy, the loss of connection, the loss of lives, and we are weary of it all. But it's just a bump, just a bump in the road to Christmas, and not just Christmas, December 25, 2020, but also the Christmas of the second coming when the newborn king comes again to put everything right. One of the most famous Christmas carols of all time, Joy to the World, is not about the birth of Christ. Instead, it is about the triumphant return of the Christ joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing. Our hope is secure, and that is what we celebrate this Christmas. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness in history. Thank you for the first Christmas, which gives us such great hope for the second. Thank you for the reminder that your hand is in control and your word is incontestable. And so our hope is secure. Amen.